All right. Well, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started today. Uh, thanks again for joining us for this webinar. Uh, my name is Alex DeHaven. I'm a project manager here at the Center for Open Science, focusing a lot on policy initiatives and specifically for registration. I'm joined by uh, Sarah Bowman. Sarah, I just want to say who you are. Yeah, I'm Sarah Bowman. I'm the product, product manager here at COS. I'm focusing on building tools to facilitate open science practices. Uh, and OSF registries is one of my core uh, products that I work on. Yeah. And so we wanted to get together to do um, a brief presentation uh, with a lot of Q&A uh, around pre-registration. So if you have any questions that you would like answered, we're going to have plenty of time for that. So please come with your questions ready and make sure you add them to the Q&A function. If you see a question in the Q&A function that you wanted answered but is already written down, you can vote for that. And we will try to get to the most voted on questions first at the end of the presentation. And uh, now we'll go ahead and get started. So what is pre-registration? Pre-registration is the practice of distinguishing confirmatory and exploratory modes of research. Now, both of these are very useful and they are integral. They play off one another for the process of science, uh, but conflating them together, um, conflating the two can get you in trouble when it comes to interpreting the results of these, of these types of research. So a little more on confirmatory versus exploratory research. Uh, in the context of confirmation, we're talking about the traditional hypothesis testing um, where the results are held to the highest standards of rigor. And the goal of this mode is to minimize the false positives. And in this mode, the p-values are actually interpretable. On the other side, we have the context of exploration. And in this context, you are pushing your knowledge into new areas generating these testable hypotheses, models, or theories. And the goal here is to minimize false negatives. In this context, the p-values are meaningless. And pre-registration is simply the specification of what you are setting out to confirm versus what you are finding along the way or you uncover incidentally. And presenting exploratory results as confirmatory will increase the publishability of the work at the expense of its credibility. So it's important to delineate between the two. So what is a pre-registration? A pre-registration is a research plan that is time-stamped, immutable or read-only, uh, created before the study is done, and submitted to a public registry. Now, some pre-registrations may use existing data if precautions are taken to mitigate and make, uh, mitigate any prior knowledge or biases the user may have um, before the study is created. So we want to make sure that we pre-specify or at least re acknowledge any prior knowledge we have about that data so we can show if it did or did not influence the resulting statistical analyses and analytical decisions. And submitting something to a public registry does not necessarily mean that it has to be public immediate. You can embargo your pre-registrations in certain, on certain platforms. Uh, I know for OSF, you can embargo for up to four years. And what we mean by that is you can timestamp it at that specific date, but leave it private for only you and your fellow authors to see until you're ready to make it public once this, the work is done. Uh, that way you don't have to be open immediately in case you're worried about sharing your plans prematurely or worried about you know, scooping or anything like that. And a pre-registration, in our view, has the following components. It has in the study plan, it has clear testable hypotheses. It has clear data collection procedures, so where you're going to get the data, what population you're going to be drawing from, any stopping rules that you may apply to, this, to your work, and then clearly defined, manipulated, and measured variables. Now, in observational studies, you wouldn't have a manipulated variable, but if you were manipulating something, you want to be very clear on how you were doing that, as well as uh, very clear on how you are measuring certain phenomena. That way it's more interpretable to your readers. And then we also recommend having an analysis plan attached to your pre-registration that dives into your statistical models. We recommend one statistical analysis per hypothesis proposed. That way it's very clear to show, you know, here's my hypothesis and this is how I plan to address and analyze that hypothesis as well as we recommend including inference criteria. So how you plan to approach the results and um, decide something is you know, significant or, or not. So some of the benefits of pre-registration are it helps protect against natural biases and selective reporting. 
in, uh, in your work. It is a great tool for communicating with others. So it's really useful for showing your advisors or your colleagues or as an interim report to show what you're working on and how you plan about uh, how you plan to do the work you've been tasked to do. It's also a very useful exercise to generate more robust planning for your research. It does require a little more effort at the outset. You can't just dive straight in, but we see that as a good thing. It allows you to better test and check your assumptions around the study and better prepare for your study so it goes more smoothly and you can, you know, it just makes it easier at the end with a little more planning at the beginning. And then also it's a very helpful reminder to your future self. Uh, research can go and evolve in many different ways and it's really helpful to have that documentation from where you've started to sort of bring you back to what you had planned to do, what you had set out to do uh, when this whole thing began. So when talking about pre-registration, we are also often asked about registered reports. Someone, some say, you know, what's the difference? Are they the same thing? Are they different? And we just get a lot of questions about them. So I wanted to briefly mention that here. Um, a registered report is a publication workflow that is centered around pre-registration. So it uses pre-registration, but it goes a little further. So here we have the traditional um, workflow in a study. You develop your idea, then you design a study to test that idea or hypothesis. You collect and analyze your data, write the report, and publish that report. Now, registered reports differs in a few different ways. The first being how it is peer reviewed. It is the peer review process is split in two stages. One occurs before you've collected and analyzed your data, and the other occurs at, tr at the traditional stage after you've written your report. So how it works is authors will submit their stage one article to a journal, and that includes the introduction, the proposed methods and analyses, and any pilot data if you have it. That is sent to the journal and that is passed out for peer review. And you can now get feedback on your proposed uh, study from experts, which is very useful because this is also before you've invested in the work itself. And then once you get uh, approved, once you pass that stage of peer review, you're granted what's known as an in-principle acceptance at that journal which means regardless of the outcomes of the study, uh, you will get a publication in that journal as long as you adhere to the plan that has been peer reviewed and all agreed upon. And so you move on, you collect and analyze your data, you write up your report, and that gets you to the stage two article. And that seems probably a little more familiar. That'll have the introduction and methods from the first stage, but it will also include those new results. So the registered confirmatory findings from your pre-registered analyses as well as any unregistered exploratory findings that you found along the way that are interesting and can help drive new discovery. Uh, and then finally, also including your discussion of your results. So pre-registration and register reports, just a little quick reminder of what they both do and what, what you know, similarities and differences. Um, they both address unreported flexibility in conducting statistical analysis. They also make clear distinction between planned confirmatory research and any unplanned discovery research. However, Register Reports takes this one step further and addresses publication bias against known results by shifting the focus of peer review from how publishable are the results to how rigorous and dependable are the methods proposed. And this also has that two-stage peer review where you can actually get feedback before you've invested your resources and time, so you can make sure it's the best methods and the best uh, path forward for addressing the hypotheses of interest. Uh, we have a variety of templates on the Open Science Framework, which Sarah may get into shortly, but I just wanted to highlight them uh, quickly. So we have seven different templates to choose from, and those vary in level of detail and rigor uh, to cater to a range of experience or needs of our users. Additionally, we have uh, community-made templates that, fill, that take pre-registration and fill in a specific niche or research area uh, in a way that we could not do and from a general point of view. And for example, we have some for fMRI studies, we have some for qualitative studies, one for secondary data analysis, as well as one for model application. And we are currently, oh, oh I skipped one, oh, there we go. We are currently working to improve the pre-registration process, uh, helping guide users through choosing which template suits their needs best, as well as uh, making the resources we have uh, more easy to discover. So it's, you can have the 
so, um, the support you need to make the best pre-registration you can. And uh, I just wanted to quickly mention some pre-registration resources. We'll be sending out the link to this, uh, these slides at the end, so you'll be able to click on all these and see them. But briefly, uh, the pre-registration revolution is an article that uh, we published at the center in 2018 that discusses pre-registration and some pragmatic you know, common, common concerns and solutions. Uh, we have a blog post by uh, seven self, called Seven Selfish Reasons for Pre-Registration that really highlights the individual's um, benefit from, for pre uh, from pre registration. We have a variety of blogs on our blog uh, at cos.io slash blog um, <clears throat> that highlight a ver variety of elements around pre registration. I mentioned this one here. This one gets into uh, this is pre registration, a plan, not a prison. This one gets into a lot of the common concerns of, well, what if I make a mistake in my pre registration? What can I do? Um, and that, that is really sort of spelled out there. We also have a lot of good examples of thorough pre-registrations from the pre-registration challenge, which was an initiative, a competition that we held uh, from 2016 to 2018 to encourage pre-registration. Uh, you can also follow us at OSF Pre-Reg on Twitter for the latest pre-registration news and examples. And finally, you can also just check out the cos.io slash pre-reg site for helpful FAQs and a variety of other resources. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Sarah and she will take you through a little demo of how to uh, pre-register on OSF. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to show some of the practical sides of, of how you do this um, on OSF and then uh, after that we can get into some of your questions and see them coming in fast and furious, which is great. Okay, so you should all see my screen now. Um, so what we're, the, fir the first thing we're gonna do is log into OSF, and I'm actually gonna do this on our, um, on our test server uh, because I don't wanna create a real registration right now. Um, so you'll go to osf.io um, and click sign in, and then you can either log into your account with your email address and your password or sign in through your ORCID credentials or through your institutional credentials if you are at an institution that has partnered with, uh, with OSF. So you'll land on your dashboard. Um, the first thing you'll need is a project. Uh, every registration is backed by a project on OSF. Uh, you might already have one created or you might need to create a new one. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and quickly create a new project. Um, really the only thing you need is the title. Um, you can add some other things. You can also, I know we've got several um, participants in the webinar from different locations around the world. You can choose your storage location of where your data will be stored. So if you happen to be um, in a country or working on some research where you need to store your data within your country, um, you can do that. Canada, Germany, um, uh, or Australia actually is a, another site that's available on our production server. So you go ahead and create your project. And um, you'll, the first thing you'll notice is up here on this right hand corner um, is that your project is private. Everything you make on the OSF is um, by default private when you make it and then later you can choose to make it public. Um, it's also a good point to call out the difference between a project and a registrations. Uh, public and private settings, they have different settings. So if you want to keep your, your project private and make your registration public, you can do that. Um, or vice versa. So um, I, I want to provide just a little bit more information to folks for when I make this project public. Um, I want to put in a description so that people will understand a little bit more about what they're reading. Um, you can also add a license which will indicate how your work can be used by others. So I'm just going to take those two really simple steps um, on my project and then you can also manage other authors on your project. So Alex and I are working on this project together. So I want to go to the contributors page and add Alex to my project. Um, so then he can also access uh, the registration that we're going to work on. And this is when you can choose your permissions, um, read, read, write, or administrator. Um, and, and basically, an administrator is the person that can control if your project is public or private, 
what the other authors on your project are and who can create that registration. So if you want um, your collaborators to be able to initiate a registration or complete a registration, you'll need to give them administrative access. Okay, so we've got our basic project structure set up. Let's dive into creating a registration. You'll click on the registrations tab and start a new registration. Alex mentioned that we have several templates built into OSF uh, to facilitate creating a registration, and I'm gonna walk through two of them, um, but you should know that there are five others. Uh, we're gonna first walk through the OSF pre-registration, um, and there are some tool tips after each, um, after each registration template title. There's a tool tip to give you a little bit of a blurb about what these, um, what each of these registration forms kind of we're trying to get at what the goal is uh, and we have we'll send the link around um, places where you can look at each of the contents of each of these forms to help you decide uh, what you what you want to use so we're going to start with osf pre-registration which is kind of the most um, comprehensive registration form we have you'll create a draft now you'll notice immediately the ui changes um, alex mentioned we're working on some improvements to uh, the OSF as a whole, but specifically starting with registries. So you'll start to see some new user interface, new user experience elements as you go through some of these pages while we're working um, ahead on these. So the first thing that you'll need to do is provide some metadata about the registration. Um, so you can give it a title that could be different from your project title. Um, So maybe your, your registration title is a question. Does political ide ideology change with age? So you will have a title, um, you can give a brief description, and this is where you lay out your hypotheses. Um, all of the required elements for the registration uh, are denoted with a red asterisk, so you'll know what you need to complete um, before you're allowed to create your registration um, and, and what things are optional. So um, as you're filling this out, if you get to something where you say, I, I'm not quite sure what an answer to that question might look like, there are some example texts. Um, you can click show example and it will drop down and show you. So all of the examples follow along with the effect of sugar on brownie tastiness. Um, thanks to David and Alex who put those together. Uh, so you'll put that information in and then you can go on to the next page. You'll notice on the right-hand side, it's telling us that it's the contents of your form have been auto-saved. So as you're going along, um, every few seconds when you stop typing, your draft is auto-saved. So if you come to um, a question that you're just not quite sure you need to think about, maybe you need to go and talk with your collaborators about, um, you can exit this workflow at any time and then re-enter it later uh, and your draft has been saved. So you go back into your registrations tab and pop into draft registrations and there's your draft um, that you were working on. So you can pick that right back up where you left off. Um, let's choose some information about blinding. Um, now you get down to study design where you need to describe your study design. Um, so maybe you've got some words to describe your study design or maybe you've got a file. Uh, and there are a number of different places on this form where you can upload a file that um, represents some aspect of your study. So you can upload that file right here to the form. It gets attached to the question that you've uploaded it to. If you're already working from an OSF project and you've already got files in it, those will appear here and you can just select them and they will be attached to that specific question. So um, this is a question about existing data. Are you um, registering a project that maybe the data already exists. So for this particular example, maybe we're using survey results that already exist. We haven't looked at them, we haven't collected that data ourselves, um, but we're going to get access to that data. So you might select that option. Um, 
how did you collect your data? This is coming from. From a survey that was done. Um, sample size, a reason for your sample size, your stopping rule. So you'll pop through all of these questions. Um, Uh, and then when you get to the end, you can review all of your, your responses and you'll see on the left hand side, it's going to alert you if there's something that was required, um, but you didn't respond to it. So in this case, it's measured variables. And I haven't provided a response. And then the next step is to create your registration, which is going to make this um, a frozen time stamped copy of your registration. And you have two options. You can either make this registration public immediately, uh, or you can embargo the registration for up to four years. And it's something that maybe you want to keep private for a little while until you're ready to publish your paper and then make it public. You can go ahead and do that. Uh, it's a simple date picker that pops up. If you embargo it for two years, say, and you really finish the work in 18 months, you can go ahead and choose to make that and that embargo early. That's always an option. In this case, I'm going to make my registration public immediately, and it's giving me the option to create a DOI, which is a digital uh, object identifier. And what this does is goes ahead and creates a persistent identifier and registers it with Datasite, which is a DOI registration agency, and will pass along some metadata about your registration to Datasite, um, and it helps uh, pass along, make your, make your work a little more discoverable, um, and again, creates a persistent identifier. So I'll say that, yes, I would like to do that, and now I'll submit. Um, you're going to get this page that lets you know that your registration is archiving. So it's creating as another copy of your project for the registration. So any files that you uploaded as part of the form, along with any files that were already in your project, are going to be copied over to a brand new um, registration. This should be pretty quick because we only had one or two files in there. So this is my registration overview page now. Um, it's letting me know that this is pending registration. I've created the registration, but I haven't approved it yet. And this is where the authors on your registration become, um, the permissions level become even a little more important. Um, so any administrator on the registration needs to approve it. They'll get a link in their email to approve or reject it. Um, and then once all of the administrators have approved it, or 20, 48 hours has passed, the registration becomes uh, permanent and public. Uh, so that's an important, um, an important thing to think about while you are choosing your permissions. So I'm gonna pop into my email and get my link. And approve my registration. So now I've got um, a permanent public registration called Political Ideology and Age. Uh, and you can see the contents of that form that I filled out right here in the middle of the page. Uh, and here's study design where I've attached my file with my study design. So you can click on that and view the file. Um, I have up here in the um, bar with the URL. Um, a five character ID that's identifying my um, my registration. So it's FBA S9 um, is my registration uh, identifier. It is linking back to my live project, which has its own identifier. Um, so it goes right back to my live project where I can keep working on my active research. And Um, 
the, the contents of this form in the middle are frozen and I can't edit them, but the metadata along the side is editable. So for example, if you were to do this work and then publish it in a journal and you wanted to link this registration to the published work, you could come down here and edit your metadata and put in the DOI for your journal article. Um, that metadata also gets sent off to data site where if you have a DOI for your registration. Um, so it's help, helping connect various pieces of the research lifecycle. Um, you can also add subjects uh, and this will help improve discoverability of your work. So this is about political ideology. So I'm gonna put this in political science. Um, that helps people who might wanna look for other work in specific subject areas. Uh, and then you can also add tags, which will help discoverability. So if I am using the survey data, I might wanna point that out. So if someone's searching for those keywords, they'll find my registration. So that is your um, registration um, of the OSF, OSF pre-reg form. Um, and I am going to go ahead and show you one other form on OSF that is um, much less detailed, um, a little more lightweight. It's called the open-ended registration, and it is one simple question, um, one simple text field. So I go back to my registrations tab on my project. I can see my completed registrations. And anyone who is um, a member of the public and might be looking at your public project will see your public registrations listed here. So if you have created multiple registrations of the same project, they'll be able to see those different registrations and when they were registered, um, try to kind of, kind of track the evolution of your, of your work. So I'm gonna go to the open-ended registration, which has one simple question, um, which is a narrative summary of why you're making this registration. And there's uh, lots of different reasons why you might use this form. Um, you might be creating an update to your existing registration. Maybe we created that OSF pre-reg um, registration and we realized there was an error in it or we've made some type of change um, to the plan for whatever reason. You might wanna create a new registration and put in some information about that here. Or maybe you're using um, a different type of registration form that is not yet on the OSF, something more specific to your discipline. Um, then you can attach that as a file. Um, so I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to, that'll attach right here. And I can say um, registration details. are included in the file that I've attached. And that is the really quick um, registration form. We've got all the registration forms from the OSF. Um, Alex will point these out um, in his slides, I'm sure. Um, all of the all of our registration forms on the OSF as a Word doc um, or as a Google doc or in various other formats that you might um, want to to download those and work on those offline. Um, and then you can either come back and put them in the form or you can upload the doc um, like you saw. Um, so that are those are two types of uh, registration forms on OSF. And then the last thing that I kind of want to just show you, I'm going to pop over to our production server and show you um, the search and discovery interface. Uh, so it's osf.io slash registries. And it's pulling in not only registrations that are on the OSF, but also registrations that come from clinicaltrials.gov or from research registry. So it's aggregating search results um, and you can filter by provider. If you are looking at a registration that's on a service that is not, it's on, it's not on the OSF, it's on, for example, clinicaltrials.gov, um, then it's actually gonna take you out to that external service to show you the results. Um, if you are searching on within OSF registries, then 
you can filter by the form type that the users have filled out. So if you are particularly interested in um, replications that might have completed the replication um, registration form, you can filter on those things. Um, I, I showed you, Alex alluded to this, and, and I showed some pieces of this where we're redesigning this workflow. So I wanted to tell you about some things that are coming. Um, one is filtering by uh, subject area. So I showed you how to add that to your registration, but it is not yet included on the discovery interface. We need to get a critical mass of folks to complete that information uh, before we can surface that. So that is one thing that's coming. Uh, Alex mentioned a workflow to help you choose what type of form is right for you. Uh, and so that is something that is, is in the works. Um, we're also uh, improving the workflow to allow you to create a registration from scratch so that you wouldn't need to have a project first, take off that first step. Um, and that is something that will be completed in Q1 or Q2 of this year. Um, let me just check my notes because I feel like there are lots of other exciting things on the way. Um, lots of improved UI. So, um, you probably saw on some of these things when you're popping back between the project and the registration. Not of all of that UI has been updated yet, but it will be. So those are exciting things to look forward to. Um, and I see we have lots and lots of questions. So mm -hmm. let's get to it. Yeah. I will start with the, the top one. The question is, can I use the same wording in a pre-reg and then later, uh, the later paper? Or do I have to be careful because of self-plagiarism? Uh, I've actually never uh, thought of it that way. Uh, we encouraged people to use their pre-registration uh, verbatim, but uh, if, if that does it cause concern for self-plagiarism, then uh, we've also seen people use pre-registration information. The information doesn't change, just the tense. It goes from future, because it's a plan, to uh, past. You, had done, you will do this versus you have done that. Uh, we encourage to uh, encourage you to use similar language because it, it shows it draws a parallel and, and keeps it very clear and concise uh, what you plan to do is actually what you ended up doing and it makes it easier on you when you go to write the whole thing up because you've already written your methods you've already written your analysis plan you just need to get it over into the final document okay um, the second question is is it okay to change authors adding slash deleting after having pre-registered, uh, can that be seen as a disadvantage for publication when the authors don't match anymore? Um, oftentimes the authors on a pre-registration and the final publication do not match um, because a lot of the published research out there right now that includes pre-registration includes pre-registered work and also unregistered work, which is totally fine. You just need to make sure that it's clearly uh, demarked what was pre-registered and what is not. We encourage you to leave authors on the pre-registration if they are um, contributing to that pre-registered work because they, they deserve that credit. But if additional uh, researchers are involved in the project and they come in after the pre-registration or add an additional feature or facet to that work, that's okay. Uh, it's okay for them not to match up as long as it's clear who did what and proper attribution is given. And, uh, if you want to mark that one, yeah. Uh, moving right along, uh, can you talk more about pre-registration of studies using existing data? What precautions need to be taken? What assurances need to be made in the pre-registration? So when using existing data, it becomes a, a little bit of a slippery slope. Uh, if, you had, if the data don't prior, uh, previously exist, then the biases you may have um, from that data are very you know, minimal, if not non-existent. With existing data, well, it's impossible for the reader to know how much you had known prior to creating the pre-registration. If you know the data very intimately and you very much understand how the data are going to lay and like the, what the results are going to be, then the pre-registration sort of is very diminished in uh, its power. But if you can't avoid it, you know, some people uh, are studying things from the past that cannot be recreated. And we also don't want to duplicate data collection efforts if there's good data out there. Uh, simply um, pre-registering and specifying what you know about that data helps uh, your reader better assess what you knew before you went into that project. Uh, and that's, that's the best you can do in situations like that is just disclose. That way it's transparent uh, that 
uh, it's transparent what you knew prior to creating that pre-registration, and then it's up to the reader in the community to assess how much, if any, bias may have crept in, which is just you know, a useful thing. Okay, next question. It's a long one. Okay, so I recently reviewed a paper and pointed out the discrepancies between the pre-registered analysis plan and the actual analyses reported in the manuscript. The authors did not mention or justify the, okay, did not mention or justify the departures. Then someone mentioned on Twitter that there can be uh, innocuous discrepancies due to information reduction on OSF. How should a reviewer judge such discrepancies then? I thought most important, uh, the most important point of pre-registration is to differentiate analyses according to the pre-reg and those that differ from it. So I agree, uh, it is strange that um, the discrepancies were not uh, listed. Now this could be just um, a learning curve where people, you know, they're trying pre-registration and they have failed to do that thing. And I, I'm happy to hear that you, were, you pointed out those discrepancies and it's strange, uh, to me it's surprising that they were not addressed. I'm not sure uh, what is entirely meant by the information reduction on OSF. Um, if you want to follow up with me offline uh, to discuss this in greater detail, I'm going to try to answer it in general, but I, I think you did the right thing by acknowledging the discrepancies, pointing those out, because it's okay to have those discrepancies. Things happen, changes are just part of life, uh, but if we don't disclose those changes or at least acknowledge the, cha the change happened and why it happened, uh, then it really does undermine the power and the validity of the pre-registration. So yeah, I, I think that was good practice. I think as a reviewer, you should judge it as you did. Um, and I'm a little confused, I'm a little, yeah, I guess confused about what is meant by the information reduction on OSF. So if you wanna follow up after this, that'd be very helpful. Uh, we have another one. Should I pre-register an exploratory study? How, uh, when there is no, when, when there's no hypothesis, how can you? So if it's, Explore, so exploratory that you don't have a clear hypothesis. You can pre-register if you'd like. You can pre-register things like a decision tree to show how you plan to explore, uh, but that is helpful, but not necessarily required. Um, we reserve, pre like we, when we talk about pre-registration, we reserve it more for that confirmation element, trying to uh, confirm any interesting hypothesis that you may have. Uh, you can, yeah, you can pre-specify if you have any prior information that you think would be very valuable to the, to your future readers and reviewers um, for your exploratory study. You can include that in a pre-registration just to show, you know, this was my thought uh, at this point in time, but I don't think it is necessarily required. Um, it's really up to you. Okay. Uh, so should I submit a link to my pre-registration project when sending my paper to a journal for publication? What about an, an, uh, and the anonymity during the review process? Um, and, and there's a follow-up with the co-editor of a journal. Uh, they include a place to provide information but require that the pre-registration be masked when we do not share pre-registration links the author is identified. Um, I think that's it's probably good practice to submit that information when you are uh, submitting your journal publication. Um, and we, the OSF offers um, some solutions for how to manage anonymity if you are having um, blinded review. Um, as long as you don't, I think this is the most important part, is that you don't include your identifying information in any of the files that you upload or any of your responses to questions. Um, but as long as you're only reference to your name um, is in that list of authors or contributors, then you can create an anonymous view only link that will strip your identifying information out. And then anyone that's looking at it is just looking at the contents of your registrations. Yeah, and I want to sort of reiterate there, uh, if you have any identifying information in a file, that can't be changed once the registration has been finalized because now it is a timestamped immutable um, page. So oftentimes we'll get, a, it's just a simple mistake, it's an accident, you accidentally have your name in the title of the file, and now you want to submit it to anonymous peer review. Unfortunately, we can't change it after that fact, so make sure if you know you're going to submit it to a blinded peer review that the files you upload and the, how, and the questions you answer do not have uh, overly identifying information for you. That way you can keep that, blind, uh, that blindness. 
Okay, another question we have, how detailed should the methods in a, uh, be in a pre-reg? Should a person be able to replicate using only the pre-reg? Um, in an ideal world, yes, a person should be able to replicate your results using only the pre-registration. Uh, that's sort of what we encourage you to strive for, providing enough detail that someone can, uh, an interested reader can take what you did and extend upon it or at least replicate it. Um, now, the, the, there's always the question of should I provide more or less? Uh, oftentimes, if you, pro like, you know, oversaturate with information that's not necessarily relevant to the research, it can sort of muddy the waters and sort of confuse and, and add to the length, which reduces the accessibility. So you want to find that sweet spot of clarity where you can very clearly specify what's being done as a, as a sort of a recipe. That way, um, uh, your readers can better use that work because, you know, the pre registration can be thought of as a tool. It's a tool that others can use to extend the research you did, or at least try to replicate the research you did. And you want to make sure that tool is as useful as possible to the readers. So I would try to think about that when you go into the method. So, you know, one, one example I'm just off the top of my head is say you're pre-registering your analysis plan and all you say is uh, you're going to do an ANOVA. Well, you could better specify that by, by using the, you know, stating the hypothesis that you're going to be testing using ANOVA and also the variables that you'll be using in the statistical test. That way it's very clear that this is the ANOVA, these are the variables that I'll be using, and this is the hypothesis that it maps back to. Uh, that way there's just a little more clarity and continuity between uh, your hypothesis and your analyses. Okay, we have another question. What is a good length? Uh, would you say that a lot of length and detail is important for a good re uh, registration plan, accounting for all the ifs and possible sub-research questions, or short plans only listing the most important research questions, hypothesis method? Um, I usually use the as-predicted template, which is about one page. So the length uh, kind of gets to the question about, you know, what, what's the good, uh, you know, how much detail is enough detail. Um, I would make sure it, it's not a tome, because then it really does reduce that accessibility. I would try to focus on one or a few key hypotheses of interest and focus on including the, um, <clears throat> the variables related to those specific hypotheses and the analyses related to those. Um, you don't need to pre-register everything under the sun in a specific discipline because that, or a specific research area because that's just too much. But you know, at the end of the day, you'll be doing a specific research project related to specific questions and generating specific data. I would try to include all of that. And if you've got related studies, I would make that known in subsequent registrations uh, for subsequent studies. Um, I hope that makes sense. When submitting a pre-reg study for publication, can you add a link to the manuscript? Oh, I think we answered this one. Oh wait, can you add it uh, without showing authors' names? Uh, yeah, yeah, Sarah, you you just answered that. Yeah. Then, so if you um, and we'll send more. Um, emails and more things to send out afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you um, go, uh, you'll want to look at the anonymous view only link um, is how you would accomplish that. And we can send some more links out to help guys about specific steps to, um, to accomplish that. All right, another question. For exploratory and confirmatory studies, is there any difference between the two in pre-registration process? Uh, yeah, I, I would say there is uh, in that in an exploratory study, we really mean you know, you're just getting out there into the unknown, trying to uncover any interesting phenomena that could then later be confirmed through follow-up studies. So in an exploratory study, we mean one that doesn't really have a testable hypothesis or direction. It just says high-level research question that you want to just get a general understanding of that you can then follow up on in a more rigorous way and confirm it and, add, and create a test that will directly um, assess the question of interest. All right. Should I list all ver uh, measures, measured variables from the study also in the pre-reg, even if they're not part of the pre-registered hypothesis analysis? Uh, that is, I'd say, solidly optional. Um, I would recommend you stick to if the variables are being used in a pre-registered hypothesis or analysis to include them. But if you think they're very useful to include, just because you're going to be collecting them anyway, and they're going to be used in a you know, sort of a follow-up uh, exploratory manner, you can include it if you want. Uh, more detail is often useful, but if you worry that it's going to bloat the pre-registration, I would at a bare minimum keep all the measured variables, manipulated variables that are directly related to the pre-registered hypotheses and analyses in, 
the pre-registration and then maybe save the other uh, variables like the total list for the project or for uh, subsequent registrations that actually directly use those measurements. Okay, we've got, what are recommended practices for reporting pre-registration processes in completed studies that are being written up for publication, e.g. referencing the pre-registration and method, connecting the pre-registration? Okay, so I definitely think you want to reference your pre-registration in the method as well as uh, maybe in the results section. So in the method, you could say, you know, this work was pre-registered, here's the link to the pre-registration. Uh, it outlines how, you know, my, my hypotheses, it outlines my study design and my data collection, it, it maps out my variables, and I'm gonna go into this a little more detail here in the method section. I would also uh, mention it in your analyses, because if you have any exploratory uh, results that you wanna make mention of, you want to make sure you clearly define what you set out to do, what's included in the pre-registration and the pre-registered, uh, the results of any pre-registered work as well, and, and separate that from any exploratory work that you've done and uncovered along the way. Okay, next question uh, we've got, is there any evidence that pre-registration improves study quality? So there is some beginning evidence, like it's still a pretty early process and it's, uh, we're still generating enough of a sample to then test it against a control that isn't pre-registered. I will say that pre-registration so far has improved the uh, public, it, it, it makes more of a space for publishing null or negative results. So that's good, it helps set the, the publication record straight or, or straighter um, by allowing you to publish work that is uh, that, that is negative or null. That way, um, <clears throat> that, that's very useful. Also, we've gotten some anecdotal evidence from participants in the registration process, uh, the, register, uh, the register report process, who say that they really enjoy getting that feedback uh, early. And you know, remember register reports, you pre-register what you're gonna do, and then you send out for peer review, and that definitely has helped. Uh, and also, the reviewers of register reports have really enjoyed helping make the study better when you can actually you know, do that instead of after the study's been run. So it improves the quality that way, but there is ongoing research and uh, efforts to, to critically evaluate, does pre-registration actually improve study quality? What does that mean? What are, how do we define that? Um, but so far, the, the clear evidence is it does definitely make space for negative and null results in the publication record, which is, which is a good thing. Okay, so now we got a long, oh, this might have been answered by a fellow uh, participant. discussion. Cool. Anyway. It's great to see. Uh, what is the incentive for journals to agree for reg to register reports? They may be agreeing to publish uh, null slash negative results. And so we kind of already got to that. Um, Jill Adelson mentioned, she says that uh, if it's worthwhile question and solid methodology, then it's important to publish negative null results. I agree with that 100%. Uh, that is one of the benefits of registered reports. As a journal editor, I appreciate that my reviewers can focus on the theory, ideas, and methods and not be biased against negative and null results. This helps combat publication bias. So yeah, that, that gets into the question previous. And, um, oh, Jesse, uh, the question asker followed up. I agree, I don't read many art, uh, articles published with negative and null results. So I'm curious if journals and editors value theory, ideas, and methods in the same way. And so, yeah, this kind of gets to uh, the, the, the reason, the motivation for register reports and for making it um, more okay to publish negative and no results is you don't see them often. There is a positive publication bias and we think that register reports is a very useful publication method that will help mitigate that and make space for negative and null results because it focuses on theory and the how the science was done instead of what happened to be uncovered, which is you know, ultimately not up to you. You can improve the quality of your study, you can improve the design, but you can't you know, guarantee that it's, public, uh, that it's um, positive and novel. Uh, so it's focusing on things that you, the researcher, can control instead of focusing on things that you can't control, which is the outcome. Okay, another question. Um, does pre-registration apply to fields like computer science where papers often present new tools and techniques rather than tests and hypotheses? So if you're not testing a hypothesis, if it's not hypothesis testing work and it's more just uh, characterization and description of a new cool tool, uh, I think pre-registration has less utility in that sort of preservation of statistical uh, validity 
but it can still be useful if you want to pre-specify, you know, how you were going about creating this. If there's a, if, if that record will help improve users um, use of the new tool or technique, then pre-registration could be useful that way. But it is probably a diminish, it's probably less useful than I'd say a, a traditional hypothesis testing uh, framework. Okay. Uh, when my data, e.g. surveys and interviews, are collected in a language other than English, should I translate to English before deposition? Uh, I think this is ultimately up to you, your resources, and your target audience. If you want to leave it in the native language, I, um, uh, you feel free to do so. Now, that may cause a barrier when it comes to the review of those, uh, the, those data. If you want to provide, we often recommend providing both if you have the resources and ability to provide a translated in raw. That way um, native speakers can engage with it and also non-native speakers can see what the translation would be. So really that's up to, to you, your abilities um, and your bandwidth really. Okay, another question. Why should I register my study at OSF instead of clinicaltrials.gov? So clinicaltrials.gov is a space explicitly for clinical trials. OSF, uh, you can register any, uh, any study that is not a clinical trial. That way you can add the benefits of pre-registration and the rigor and um, transparency without it having to be a clinical trial. So that, that's why I would do that at OSF instead of clinical trials, because clinical trials is a very specific selective repository for a clinical trial. And for non-clinical work, you can definitely do that at OSF. Uh, I also personally think that it, the registration schema and um, information is more discoverable on OSF. That may be because I work here and I've read thousands of them, but I've always found that like clinical trials, it's harder to find the, the, the important things that I'm looking for, whereas OSF, it feels much cleaner, easier to get to, because you can link straight to that pre-registration, whereas in clinical trials, you provide that identifier, you have to go search it, and then you get this big web page that has a variety of links and uh, characteristics. But that may just be a uh, learning curve uh, for me. Okay, when would you not pre-register? Okay, in what scenario slash situation? So uh, we generally recommend, you know, holding off on pre-registration. If you're more in that exploratory mode, I'm still trying to figure out where I want to go, what questions I want to really test directly and explicitly. If you're just trying to cast a wide net to see what is interesting, if you're in that sort of context, uh, you probably don't need to pre-register that. You can, like I said earlier, you can pre-register some uh, uh, decisions of like how you plan to explore, but that's optional. That's really up to you. Uh, really, we recommend pre-registration when you are in that context of confirmation. When you found something interesting and you want to see if it holds up to that additional scrutiny, add it, add a pre-registration to it, uh, and uh, go from there. Um, I'm gonna give Alex's voice a rest <laughs> yeah, right. um, and pop mm -hmm. down uh, to a question we have about creating a registration form built on Prisma P, the reporting guiding, guidelines for systematic review protocol, and if so, so how should the community show that it's interested? Um, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. um, we're very much interested in working with different communities of folks that work in different um, different disciplines have different um, needs and we want to learn more about um, those needs and about the, the norms and practices in your community. So definitely reach out. Um, you can email me directly. You can email support at osf.io and those fine folks will get you in touch with me. Um, we're, we're interested in partnering with these groups and, and finding ways to meet your needs um, and, and grow a community of, around um, open science practices and open around, around um, registration. So definitely reach out. Um, we still have <laughs> 10 questions, mm -hmm. but we're bumping up on time. Um, so I, I think we've got a record of all of these questions and we can follow up with these questions after the webinar. Um, we're also going to send out a link to the recording as well as a link to our slides from today uh, and some other resources that you all can use to keep this conversation going. Um, and then I think we're also gonna turn some of these um, questions into a blog post. So um, we can follow up with you individually or follow up with you in mass so that everybody can get the answers to these um, great questions. Yeah. Well, I was there was one that I was gonna answer, oh, yeah. but uh, we can save that for later. But, um, 
there, there was one question was, what types of errors in a pre-reg are you allowed to correct using the short uh, registration process? So these are errors that may be you know, clerical. It may just be a, a, a lot of typos that really confuse the language, or maybe you are a grad student and you're in a methods class and you pre-registered one type of uh, statistical analysis, but you realize another one would be better suited for you, or you get feedback from an advisor or something like that. Uh, you want to update the methods before you've actually started to do the work or before you've started to analyze the study. That would be the type of thing that you'd want to update your pre-registration uh, using that short registration process where you would you know, just briefly define the change you want to make, why you want to make those changes, uh, and the state of the project at the time that decision was made, and then also um, just for visibility's sake, the link to the original pre-registration. Because you know, often, and also another example just while I'm thinking about it, is say you're having issues with uh, data collection and you're not getting the uh, number of participants you need, you can start to, uh, if you need to add an additional recruitment method or something like that, you can include it there. But again, we encourage you not to um, update the pre-registration after you know the results because now it becomes, an, it enters that gray area of are you making these changes because you've seen the results and you're looking for positive and, and novel or are you, you know, changing it because it's a methodological issue. And uh, I think with the rest of these, I think we'll follow up, like, like Sarah was saying, offline. Um, thanks everybody for coming out uh, and joining us today. I hope this was informative and useful. If you have any other questions, please feel free to follow up an email. Uh, we will be, um, <clears throat> like, like Sarah said, following up with a link to the slides, a link to um, answers for these questions and additional helpful resources that we didn't get to uh, in this webinar. Um, yeah, and with that, have a great day. Thank you all.